And so I don't know if you guys can um, just find the whatever key that I come up with to sing this song. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide, holds me closely to himself. And with love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. God will make a way. I want you to prophesy into your own life that God will make a way where there seems to be no way because he works in ways that we cannot see and he will make a way. So let's take it one more time. God will make a way. Let's go. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide, holds me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. I want to encourage you here, folks. When the prophetic word comes forth, one of the ways by which we can demonstrate to God that we believe in the word that comes forth is that we begin to put works to buttress our faith. The man of God says, show me your faith by your works. Without being calculated on my own, it's not like I am trying to be calculated. The word of God came forth and said, we have come to a season wherein there is an intertwining of our worship together with the prophetic that we will not be able to tell the difference between or where the separation is between our worship and the word of God that is coming forth concerning our hearts concerning our homes concerning our situations and so what do we do when the word when the word comes forth like that we engage ourselves more in worship on Saturday man the leader quoted from from Psalms 149 that talks about making up songs to the Lord even in our beds. And, and I've been doing that. And I'm telling you, it's very empowering. It's transformative. And so I want to encourage you, make up songs on your own, in your closet, in your secret place, and sing to the Lord. Because it is in that place of worship that you will begin to hear the voice of God. Let me tell you something. Since that word came forth, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but every now and again, the Lord will inspire a song, not something that we have rehearsed, because it doesn't have to be perfected in technicality, but our praise is perfected when it is in accordance with the heart of God. And so one more time, I want to encourage you, unless you don't need a way to be made in your life. If you don't need a way, I know somebody who does. So why don't you be an intercessor today and pray that God will make a way for somebody else. So we're going to take that song one more time. I don't want you to be too focused on the technicalities, okay? We are prophets, we are not psalmists. But if we happen to sing and sing well, it's all good. But what we want to do is prophesy right. You see what I mean? So one more time, God will make a way. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide, holds me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you because we know that you will make a way. For every one of those situations that appear to be daunting, you will make a way. In every circumstance that we may have felt a little overwhelmed, you will make a way. The psalmist said, when my heart is overwhelmed, you led me to a rock that is higher than I. You will make a way. Praise the Lord. 
Hallelujah. Alrighty, God is good. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. We're going to do a mix of teaching and praying today. A mix of teaching and praying. I want to tell us or remind us of a story out of the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. And if you don't know where 2 Kings is, it's right after 1 Kings, which is after the, the books of Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel. Uh, this is a story that even myself I haven't read in a while. But look at what it says. 2 Kings chapter 6, we will do a little bit of reading here. And the Bible says here in the very first verse of 2 Kings chapter 6, are we all there? Um, can we have more light? Is this it? Can, can we read our Bibles? Is this enough light for you to read? Okay, God is good. Josh, can you read? That is good. It's good to see you, by the way. Yeah. I heard you were coming last week. I was looking out for you and you didn't come. But, but you're here now. That is what matters. That is excellent. God is good. Good to see you. Praise the Lord. Now, um, let me just excite you with this uh, uh, piece of information. Um, the Lord said that he is on the move. And he is ready to move with those that will move with him. And so when God is on the move, things happen. And it took a while for certain people to learn that, but Moses learned that very quickly. Oh, Brother Matthew, thank you so much. You were in the spirit. Absolutely, that is great. So God is saying, I am on the move and I am looking for those that will move with me. You know, there are, God operates in different dimensions. And some dimensions of God are also introduced to us in phases, okay? Remember the Shekinah glory of God, how it keeps taking a different form. In the daytime, it will be a cloud that will shield the children of God from the heat of the sun. And at nighttime, it becomes a pillar of fire. A pillar of fire because fire brings light and it also brings warmth. So at night when it gets cold, God warms them up and he also allows for them to have enough light to do light and to feel safe. Because when you are in the wilderness, the last thing you want is abject darkness. Because let me tell you one of the things that happen in the wilderness. The wilderness is designed by God in such a way that even though it is lifeless for the most part, it mimics life in the nighttime. When the wind blows through the crevices in the rocks, they produce sound. I remember one day the Holy Spirit took me into a vision. And I saw a people with advanced understanding of how things work in the world. And they, something happened to them almost like uh, a, a, a kind of judgment that was taking them out. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, watch what they're about to do. And you know what they did? They started to arrange stones in such a way that after they were gone and the wind blows, the sound that the stones will make will bring the memory of their existence into whatever comes to life in that region. When I saw that, I was like, man, this will make a nice movie, Holy Spirit. You see, because it's a way of preserving one's essence through the sound that nature can make. You know that one of the lessons that we can draw from that is if a people made by God were able to operate with that kind of understanding to preserve their legacy, how much more God who says that you are his offspring. The Lord allows the sound that comes from the obstacles of our lives to produce in us wisdom. To produce in us the sounds of the spirits of God. But you and I have the responsibility every now and again to align those things by godly wisdom. And so the wilderness operates like that. And so if you have abject darkness and at night you begin to hear the howling of animals that are not there, you will not be able to tell whether they are or not. And so God allowed for them to have some measure of light at night. 
But guess what? It was the same Shekinah glory of God that was morphing in the day it's a cloud and at night it's a pillar of fire. So when God says, I am on the move, there is usually a transformation that happens. It's almost as if the presence of God, as far as it comes to your existence, is concerned, takes a different form. And when it takes a different form, many things happen. Let me tell you three of the four major things that happen. There begins to be progress in your life. Because every time God moves, God moves you closer and closer to the fulfillment of promise. You see, because God is not a random God, God is very intentional and he plans what he does with you. The Bible says that the thoughts that I have toward you, they are not of evil, but of good to give you a future and a hope to bring you to an expected end. God has an end that he already expects of you. And so when he moves, he moves you closer to the fulfillment of promise. He moves you closer to the actualization of destiny. One of the other things that happens when God makes a move is before God moves, he gets up sometimes. Let me say that because I know that there are theologians in the house. Because we know that there are times when God moves without standing up. The throne of God is a mobile throne. It's a throne that has wheels. Remember when Ezekiel saw the throne of God, he saw the wheel within the wheel. And so we know that the throne of God can move. So there are times when you experience God. He's still sitting down on his throne, but there is movement. But, there are, but when you look, talk about the wilderness experience, for the most part, he would get up. And when God gets up, what happens? The posture of God neutralizes the opposition. The Bible says, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. So not only are you getting closer and closer to the fulfillment of promise, even you start getting restored in your form. Because sometimes the enemy is your flesh. And when the Bible says, let God arise and let the enemies be scattered, because the Bible says to be carnally minded is enmity against God, even some of your own carnal desires will begin to fizzle away when God gets up. And so when God says, I am on the move, you need to be full of joy because right now it means I'm getting closer. Yeah. And now it means I'm getting better. I'm getting healed. I'm getting more of, I'm, I'm becoming more of my spirit self led by the spirit as opposed to the dictates of the flesh. The third one is probably the one that is most interesting. You see, when God gets up, the Bible says in Matthew chapter four, Jesus speaking to Satan, he says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God but him alone shall you worship. You see, when God gets up, creation bows to him. When God is on the move, everything worships him. How do we know that? God said, go in my name and be led forth in joy. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing and the trees of the field shall clap their hands. So when God is on the move, everything starts to align and sing his praises. So the people that do not like you begin to serve you. Come on, you didn't hear that. God says to us, he says, when you go in my name, the mountains and the hills will break forth into singing. The same mountains and hills, hills that were making awkward sounds at night, they were sounding like wolves that are howling. But when the Lord gets up, the melody changes. And God is saying, I'm not only getting up and making a move, but I am inviting you to come along with me. So when you are walking in the company of the Most High God, you're getting closer to the fulfillment of destiny. You're getting better as a person, being more led by the Holy Spirit. And then everything starts to pay obeisance to you. The mountains and the hills begin to worship, begin to sing the praises of God. And even the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Why? Because the word of the Lord shall be forever. I thought that would excite you a little bit. Because in the season that we're in, God says, I am getting ready to move. You know, there are times when God sits and he expects you to sit with him. When, God, when Jesus sat in the house of Lazarus, he expected everybody to sit with him. But Martha was too busy fulfilling what she was not sent. That's why the Bible says, do not lean on your own understanding. Because there are certain times when your understanding is telling you that you are in a desperate situation, so you need to panic. You're in a desperate situation, so you need to run and seek help. Whereas the Lord is saying, it might appear desperate, but I am here and I am sitting down. 
Remember when the disciples were told by Jesus to come along to the other side. The storm started to blow. The wind was boisterous. And because they were fishermen, their understanding and their experience suggested to them that whenever there was such a boisterous wind, it was against them. And they said it. They said, behold, I'll be it. The wind is contrary. It is not everything that appears to be an opposition that is an opposition. When somebody blocks your number, it doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. That might be the Lord moving them to give you some space. At least they're no longer coming to suck your precious blood and take your precious time. Even if in their hearts they meant it for evil, the Bible says the Lord wills it for good. And so when the wind came, that same wind that came, came to help them get to the other side. They were, they were on the boat for crying out loud that did not have an engine. And so it relies on the wind. But for some reason, because of the intensity, they thought that it was against them. Let me tell you something. When God is on the move, those things that appear to be against you will start to work for you. But one thing that we have to bear in mind in the midst of all of these things is that God is on the move and is pulling you to come alongside with him. You cannot afford to do it your own way. Because you know, we're very good at hijacking God's plan. And we're like, wow, God, this is what you want to do. You want to prosper me? I'm going to go rob a bank. Because I can see me spending money. You see? Yeah, that's what we like to do. We like to hijack. We like to think of our own ways of fulfilling. And God is like, my ways are not your ways. All I am asking you to do is just sit with me. Jesus was in the belly of the boat. He was resting. Now, if Jesus was resting, what business do I have being where I can even see the storm in the first place? Jesus was not seeing the storm where he was. The things you see are the things that scare you the most. But just imagine if you saw what the Lord sees. If you're seeing what the Lord is seeing, guess what? Your heart will be at peace also. But Satan is always in the business of showing you the things. You know, like I told you about a year and a half ago, that faith is calling the things that aren't, the things that are not, as though they are, so that they can be. So what is the opposite of that? Fear. Fear is calling the things that are as though they are not so that they can cease to be. That is the opposite. And so Satan will make the things that are like the wind that you can see and call it what it is not. He calls it opposition. He calls it desperation. He brings you frustration so that you can lose that which you already have, which is the peace of God. And that is how the enemy operates. But we cannot continue to take our dictates from Satan. Oh, come on now. You know the Bible says, <laughs> as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. The original intention of God for us while we're still babes is not to do things based on our own understanding, but to recognize how to do things by the leading of the Holy Spirit. When God brought all the animals to Adam to see what he would call them, Adam was not guessing. He was not doing that by his own understanding. He was doing that purely by the leading of the Holy Spirit. How do I know? Because he had yet to partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he wasn't doing it out of knowledge. He was doing it by the leading of God, which is called wisdom. And the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. So what happens to you if you try to get knowledge before you have gotten wisdom, you get kicked out of the garden. Someone did not get what I said. What does it mean to be kicked out of the garden? To lose your peace. To lose your joy. When they were in the garden, they had peace. They had joy. You see what I mean? Because the Bible says that there is a river that flows from the presence of God. And it flows through the areas and the region of the city of God. And it brings healing wherever it goes. And that river is called the river of joy. And that was the river that was flowing from Eden to what? To water the entire garden. So we knew that they had joy. 
You may need to go and study once again the geography of the Garden of Eden and then you begin to appreciate exactly what it means to be in the presence of God because from that presence of God flows everything that you need. But Satan does not want you to sit where God is sitting because if you sit like Mary sat close to Jesus, you have peace and when you have peace, Satan does not have peace. So that's why he wants to tell you to start running around to help yourself so that you lose your peace so that he can have a moment of peace. Because when he got kicked out of heaven, he lost the righteousness, the peace and joy because those are the components of heaven. And so since he lost it, he's been looking for it. And so when he finds you, the one in whom is the kingdom of heaven, he wants you to walk away from the things that are yours so that he can enjoy it for a little bit. It's like God has given you a beautiful condominium in town and Satan is homeless. So what does he do? He makes a phone call to you and says, Anita, run very quickly. Leave your door open. There is fire on the mountain. And then you run. And then he goes to sleep on your bed. And it's like, oh, until she recognizes who she is in Christ, I'm going to enjoy this condo. When you think about it that way, you're not going to let the devil bother you anymore. Praise the Lord. So God is on the move and is looking for the people that will walk with him. Let me even take the liberty of telling you seven things that are essential for walking with God. Thing number one is that when God is on the move, he gets up. That means you also need to get up. What does it mean to get up? To get up means to apply works to your faith. You understand what I mean? Several times God is moving and he expects us to get up to move with him, but we do not believe enough to even get up. Look at those people that Jesus healed. Several of them, he would say to them, you are, you are whole, but they're still sitting there. He would have to tell them, take up your bed. What does it mean? If you truly believe that you're healed, if you have faith for the assignment that I've given to you, what will you do? You will begin to put some works to your faith. If God says that I am sending you to the nations, what do you do? You don't just wait until the airplane comes to, the do to your doorstep. You start to put works to your faith. You start to make preparations for what will happen when you're gone. You start to study the scriptures more so that when you get to where you're going, you're not repeating messages. You are loaded with, with the word. So one of the fundamental things or steps that are required for us to walk with God is to begin to do the works. Second thing, I may not go through all seven because I still want us to read these. Um, if I, what I'm going to do is let's read these second kings because we, we might even be able to draw four of them so we can kill two stones or two birds with one stone. Yeah, you have to be Chuck Norris to be able to kill two stones with one bird. And the guys in the house, they get the joke. You know, Chuck Norris is such a powerful fellow that when he was born, he named his parents. Yeah, I like, my, I like them Chuck Norris jokes. Yeah, yeah, you know how it is. You know, because sometimes you need to remind yourself that you're even stronger than Chuck Norris. You see, because the Bible says with God, all things are possible. So when God is on the move and you're walking with him, everything becomes a possibility. Oh, yeah. If I let me tell you something, I want to make you a promise by God. You see, the Bible says when a man's way pleases the Lord, it makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. God will give you a sign in the days to come. Some of your enemies will start to attempt to make peace with you. If you catch it, you have it. Praise God. Second Kings chapter 6. Now, we'll do one thing very quickly before we read the Second Kings. And one of the things that I have come to understand is through the parable of the sower. I have come to understand that it is not the seed, but the soil. Because the Bible says, and the ground, the soil, all by itself produced. The same seed that fell on the wayside that didn't make it. The same seed that fell among thorns that got terminated was the same seed, same DNA, same species that fell on the good soil and the difference was very clear. So when the word of God is about to come forth, it is the same word that brother Matthew hears that energizes his faith to go to the nations. It's the same faith word that some people will hear and take offense and say they're not coming to church anymore because the pastor was preaching against them. Same word. So what's the difference? 
One had a stony heart that was not ready to repent before the Lord, whereas another one had a loose heart before the Lord, like a loose soil, ready to go in the direction that the Lord leads. So as the word of God is coming forth today, what kind of heart are you going to receive it with? You know, someone like Alan, when he hears the word of God, they become pictures in his mind. Not in the very moment, but afterwards. You know, there are times when I will have a conversation with him one day and the next day he would tell me a dream that he had. And I would say, the dream you had is the picture of the conversation that we had. Same word. And so you need to find out exactly how your system processes the word of God and begin to make the most of it. For me, quite often when the word of God comes, it begins to condition my emotions. I started to feel a certain way when the word of God comes. The boldness comes. Sometimes it is the humility that comes. Sometimes it is the trembling. Wherein God makes a declaration concerning himself and I begin to tremble because I know what will follow. So you need to understand the instrumentation of the word of God. So before we read the second Kings, I want to show you something in Matthew chapter 8. Let's start reading from verse 12. Because we need to learn how to condition our hearts because I want this word of God today to do you most the most good. The book of Matthew chapter 8. We kind of um, took a break from, let me put this up right. We sort of took a break from Jeremiah, didn't we? And we've been in Matthew quite a bit lately. So Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. And I'm looking forward to teaching again from the book of Zechariah. You see the book of Zechariah chapter 13 and 14. I've taught about it. I've taught from it once before, but I believe it's time to get into it again. Um, and, and I'll tell you more about it uh, later on, but just if you want to give yourself a, a head start and study those things, it will do you good. Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. Look at what it says. It says, but if I let us read from verse 11, it says, and I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then verse 13 says, Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be for you. Jesus is saying, This word of the covenant that has come forth. Some people who are here, when the word came forth, will be cast into outer darkness. Whereas people from far away that will hear it later on, as it echoes back from the ends of the earth, they will be able to benefit from that word of promise even more than the sons of the house. And what is the difference? The difference is in the posture of their hearts. Jesus made it even clearer in verse 13. He said to the centurion, he said to the centurion, he says, as you have believed, so shall it be done unto you. You will sit with Abraham. Whereas some of these ones who had been reading the scriptures, some of the Pharisees and the Sadducees whose fathers were there as primary recipients of the word of God will end up missing out completely because their hearts were stony ground before the Lord. So whenever the word of God comes forth for it to do you good, you need to be ready to believe the word. When you hear things from the Old Testament, please do not think of what Hollywood has presented to you. Because a lot of what's in the Old, Test Old Testament looks like fairy tales. It looks like, um, you know, the Harry Potters and the rest of them. You always just think of these people as superhumans. Oh, David, a little scrunchy boy, fell in Goliath. Oh, that guy must be one of the gods. No, he's just a man, just like you. So if you don't stop thinking about those people as superhuman, you will not aspire to have their experiences and their testimonies. So when we go into the Old Testament and we read these things, See yourself as one of those people coming from the east and the west, the ends of the earth, receiving the word of God and benefiting the most out of it because you believe. All right? Okay, so having said that, now let's go to this, this 2 Kings chapter 6. 
Like I said, today we will pray even in the midst of the teaching. So get ready. Verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 6. This is the story of the floating axe head. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. I don't know about you, but where I'm at right now is too small for me. And the reason why God got up is because he's going to prepare a place for me. So when God says he's on the move, then you know that he's about to take you to a place that is bigger than where you've been. So, praise the Lord, God is good. So, I want us to pray. We're going to start with a prayer of thanksgiving. And say, Father, I thank you for growth. I thank you because of your faithfulness, of your loving kindness that has allowed for where I'm at to become small for me. When I came to this house, when I came to this place, he was the biggest place I'd ever been. And I was like, wow, look at what God has done. But now it has become too small for me. Because not only have I grown, the Lord has also opened my eyes to see that there is more. When I got this job, I was delighted. I was excited. I gave a testimony at church. I did a video on YouTube and on Facebook. But now this job and the opportunities and the rewards that he presents have become too small for me. So Father, we thank you for that realization, for that awareness. Father, some people's environments have become too small for them, but ignorance would not allow for them to know that it's time to move. And even though you are on the move, they want to stay where they're at. They want to build a tabernacle where they have been. Father, we thank you because we are not like those who have, who have decided to build a tabernacle for that which they have outgrown. Father, we thank you because this place has become too small for us. Praise the Lord. Father, we give you praise. So let us continue. God is good. Verse 2 says, we're going to combine verses 2 and 3 in a prayer. It is one of my favorite kinds of prayer. And i tell you the reason why. It is a prayer whose results are visible in progression. The result of the prayer that we're about to say is like that of a man. It's like seeing a man climbing a mountain. You can see it progress. And the way by which you are going to receive the fullness of the experience is to be patient and to be hopeful. So now let us read it. Second Kings chapter 6 verse 2 and 3. We're going to read those together. And we're not going to pray until we have read four. So there'll be two prayer points. Verses two and three, one prayer point. Verse four, another one. So look at what it says. It says, please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, go. Go. This is what I was telling you earlier about being able to do the work. He says, let each and every one of us go and carry the beam. Faith without works is dead in itself. If we truly believe that we're coming into a season wherein we will experience the angelic and the supernatural here at Communion House, we need to do the work of bringing others in to come and experience the same. Simply because you can multiply your blessing by the number of people that you want to bless. Let me explain that. There was one, boy's little, one little boy's lunch that got multiplied. The coefficient or the multiplier of the blessing was directly proportional to the demand or the mouths that needed to be fed. And so if you want God to bless you greatly, then make sure that the posture of your heart is such that you can envision many others getting blessed because of you. It is heaven's multiplier. If you're thinking of feeding only your family, God will make that happen. Remember, God does not give you more than you can handle. 
And so if your expectation is just so that you and your, little, your family can go on little vacations here and there to places where you can drive to, that will happen. God does exceedingly abundantly above what you ask or imagine. So you might even be able to go to some place where you go by air. And you're like, oh my God, we only wanted to drive to North Carolina, but look at us now, we're flying to Alaska. <laughs> but it's only going to be you and your family. But when you begin to posture your heart such that you're already thinking about whose child you would help, which families you will raise, then heaven will know that you are able to receive the blessing the way God gives it. Because when God gives his blessing, he gives it to all. Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I'm not just going to stay up by myself. I will draw all unto me. So tap into your multipliers now by beginning to envision how you will be a blessing to other people. Faith without works, once again, is dead. So one of the works is prepare yourself to create a room for others. But that's not the prayer just yet. It's just an understanding. Let's go now to the prayer. Verse 3. Then one said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. What did verse 2 say? Verse 2 says, go. Verse 3 says, I will go. Why is God on the move? God is on the move because he told you to go. But he knows that you are not supposed to go until he is moving and going with you. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I've said this before. Myself and brother Matthew, we've had multiple debates on this subject. God does not ask you to do things that himself hasn't done. Because God in his faithfulness will not allow for you to have someone else as an example other than himself. God does not trust you with anybody else. Let me say that again. God does not trust you with anybody else. The Bible says that we have a high priest that is not alien to the feeling of our infirmities, but who in every way as we are tempted was tempted. And he remains now an example for us, even according to the order of Melchizedek. You see, we have this high priest who is an example because of the fact that if God would allow somebody else to be an example to you, you would always fall short of his glory because nobody else can meet the mark that God sets. That's why he says, be holy as I am holy. Jesus said, as I am in this world, so are you. He says, the things that I do, shall you do. Even greater works because I go to the Father. God is saying, I am going to the Father and now not only are you following my example, you will now have my act accompaniment. Let me say that again in English and very slowly. If I do something and you come after me and I say, Alan, I have written instructions of exactly how I accomplished this task. Follow the instructions. I am no longer there. You are following the instructions. If you follow it closely, you will deliver exactly what I have delivered. But if I were to be there with you while you're doing it, your result will be even better because by the time I'm doing it again, I am doing it with exponential effect. And you now have my full support. So the reason why Jesus guaranteed that we would do greater works is not because we are greater than he is, but because he knows that the moment he goes up, the Holy Spirit will come and he will be alongside with us, teaching us and bringing to our remembrance all of what Jesus said. What does that make sense? This is the reason why you need the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus has set the example for you. But when you start doing it on your own, what if you forget how he did it? You were not there when he was doing it. And you might be saying, mm, I think Jesus must have done it this way. No, he says, I, you're not going to be guessing. My Holy Spirit will go with you. That was the reason why the ministry of Moses was like no other. And when Jesus was to be born, the Bible says God is going to make, God is going to send to us a prophet as unto Moses. Why? Because Moses tapped into the ministry of the Holy Spirit long before anybody else. At least long before most people. How did we know that? Moses says, Lord, if you do not go with us, we will not make a move. That is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody else Almost everybody else you read about in the Old Testament, 
Did they have the Holy Spirit inside of them all the time? No, the Holy Spirit will come upon them. So there were moments wherein they were led by the Spirit and moments wherein they were not. But Moses was like, I am not going to make a move unless you are with me. And how is God with us? God says to Moses, tell the people that I will be with them in the person of my angel, the one that does not forgive. That is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says any blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not forgiven. He says it will lead you in the way that you should go. He says, but do not grieve my angel because he will not forgive. That was the introduction of the Holy Spirit. Moses caught that revelation and he says, we will not go unless you are with us. So the reason why God says I am on the move, God is saying everything that I've asked you to believe for, everything that I've asked you to do, I am now ready to perform every single one of those things. Even though I said you should go to the ends of the earth, I'm not expecting you to go alone because I'm the one that is called alongside. The Bible says his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. So when God is on the move, he's not about to go do some magical thing that is going to leave you puzzled. No, he's exactly going to fulfill that which he has told you to do. Verse 2, the man of God said to them, go. And verse 3, he says, I will go with you. The Lord has chosen to come with you. Even though it appears as though you are the one coming with him. Do you know I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, wait a minute, you are coming with me, but it appears as though I am coming with you. Can you, can you guess? Do you have ideas of how that works? Now the way, <laughs> let me tell you, the reason why it appears as though you are the ones going with God, as opposed to God coming with you, is because God has already been. So it's always a step ahead. And that's why he says, go in my name. So you take the same steps that I am taking. The significance of that when you get it is now you understand that there is no gambling with God. God is not asking you to do a thing that he hasn't already done. So don't be afraid when God is saying to you, be generous. Don't say, wow, God, what if I give all of what I have as you are commanding me to give? What is going to happen to me? God is like, but wait a minute, I've already given. I once gave all of what I had. And look at me, I'm not broke. If anything at all, I have gained everything else. Hmm. I will get it eventually, I hope. But the reality of it is when God is inviting you to come along with him on a journey, he wants you to do it with all boldness, with all confidence, because he has already gone ahead of you. So what is the prayer point from verse 2 and 3? The prayer point is that, Lord, thank you because you are coming with me. Father, I thank you because you have gone ahead of me. You are coming behind me and you are also going along with me. And so, Lord, I thank you because every step that I take is in you. Every move that I make is in you. And Lord, because you are pulling me by the hand to come with you, I thank you, Father, because the way has been made straight ahead of me. Because when the Lord moves, he makes the crooked path straight. Let my confidence in you be unwavering. Let my confidence in you be unshakable. In the mighty name of Jesus. We're going to repeat that prayer once we have an understanding of what the fourth verse says. Verse 4, and this is where we're going to wrap it up, but come with me to verse 4. He says, and the Bible says here, so he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan to cut down the trees, but when, but when they came to the Jordan, they cut down the trees. Let's read that one more time. I'm getting ahead of myself because I have a thought that I want to share with you. But it, you'll get it now. It says, so he went with them and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down the trees. Folks, many of us have a picture in our minds of the house that God has prepared for us. An already finished building. And that is the picture that we're running with and there's nothing wrong with it. But we need to understand that for every house that God has promised you, there is a process of cutting down the trees. And that is exactly where many people lose it. Many people get there 
And rather than give God thanks for the trees, they complain that there is no house. They said, Lord, what have you done? You brought us here telling us that there is a house that is bigger than where we're coming from. And now we're here in this forest, just trees. Where is the house that you promised? The children of Israel, God said to them, come out of Egypt into a land that I will show you where you will worship me, a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And when they came out of Egypt, what did they see? They saw enemies, opposition, and they're like, God, where is the milk and honey? And God is like, yeah, you have to cut down the trees. Why did they describe the enemies as much taller than them? Because those are the trees. Have you ever seen a tree that you are taller than? When you see a proper tree, like the cedars of Lebanon, next to those trees, you are like a grasshopper. That was why when they got to the land of Jericho, they said we are like grasshoppers in their sight. And God is like, absolutely, because I need you to cut down the trees. And with those trees, you will build the habitations that I have promised you. God says, because I am coming with you, it's not going to be a daunting process. Because I am coming with you, it's not going to be an arduous process. You see, because I know how to cut the trees that I made. Do you know that one of the main things about the ministry of Jesus when he, intro when he was introduced to the world was that he would know or he would show us how to cut down trees. When, when John the Baptist was telling us about Jesus, what did the Bible say? The Bible says now that the Messiah is being revealed, the ax is laid to the roots. He's coming with you, you don't have to. You see, imagine if the man of God, and I'm going to just summarize the rest of the story because we don't have time to go through it. You can read it on your own. Imagine if the man of God did not go with them to cut down the trees. They would have completely failed because while they were cutting the trees, the axe head fell into the water. And they went to the man of God and said, man of God, what did they call him at that particular point in time? They called him their father. They said, father, my father, my father, the axe head that we borrowed has fallen into the water. That would have been the end of it. Good luck trying to find an axe head underneath a rapid river. Because remember, this was the Jordan. And the Jordan is not a lake. It's not like Lake Lanier. It's very difficult to find things in the body of water that is moving. Especially if it's the Jordan. You know why? The Jordan is not very wide. The Jordan is very narrow. And so when you have a narrow river, the currents are faster. And that is stronger current. And so that axe could have gone anywhere underneath the water. And you that is trying to figure it out, the water is constantly trying to move you away from the target. It was an impossible task without the Lord. And why did God design it that way? God did not want you or God does not want you to be in a situation wherein you fall for the same temptation that Satan fell for. Satan thought he could be a God unto himself. And since that moment, God made sure that man will never be like Satan. As human beings, the reason why we always need God every step of the way is because God in his loving kindness orchestrated it that way so that we always remember who we are and who he is. So the prayer that we're going to bring out of this is twofold. Prayer point number one is, Lord, help me to see what you have promised. You see, because many of us, even though God is on the move, if you are not instructed right and your heart is not prepared right, you can mistake the move of God for an opposition. Many of us in the past, we have been disappointed even though God is doing a great thing in our lives, but because we're looking through the natural eyes and we're seeing trees instead of houses, we start to condemn the process of God. We start to complain just like the children of Israel. And everyone who complains will never attain the promise. The Bible says it is through faith and patience. Look at when Jesus was going to the cross. The cross did not look like glory. But what did God promise Jesus? Glory. Because it was concerning Jesus that he was prophesied that the one who was a son will become a servant, that he may step into the glory of the Father. And he was going to the cross. Ain't nothing glorious about going to the cross, but Jesus was able to see what the Father saw. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. So I want you to pray that God would allow for you to see his promise.
when you get to the trees, you need to see the house. Let me tell you something. God raises people and systems to work for you, not against you. But those systems cannot inhabit the promised land alongside with you. You need to get there and say, thank you very much. Your time is up. I'm cutting you down. We need to cut down the trees that have been holding the raw materials for our miracle. We need to cut them down. I'm going to give you some examples very quickly so that when we pray, you can target your prayers. Okay? Let me tell you one of the trees that we have come to be faced with in this life. Technology is so advanced today and is working against many of us. When you're studying the word of God today, you can achieve within minutes what took days 20 years ago. 20 years ago, when you're studying the scriptures, most of us had to go to a couple of people's houses to borrow materials. I remember there was a guy who had a, who had a strong concordance. We couldn't afford one, so we would have to make time to go to his house. And, and then he's watching over your shoulder so that you don't put too much speed while you're opening the pages. Because that is the only copy he has and there's nobody else in town that we knew who had one. But now you have apps on your phone that are 12 times better than that little book that we all used to borrow. So technology now that has come to make things easy for us to be able to build and equip ourselves in righteousness is now standing as a tree, as an opposition because rather than using it to study the word, you're using it to amuse yourself all day long. You go from cat video to dog video. From dog video to all kinds of videos. And there is no shortage of entertainment online simply because everybody wants to use technology. Even the enchantress wants to use technology. So that is a tree that needs to be cut down. What does it mean to cut down the tree? To bring it to subjection to the purpose of God. So everything that has risen against you can be brought to subjection. Even your debt that is as torn as a tree, it can be brought into subjection. Because it constitutes a need that heaven has promised to meet. So your blessing has a multiplier already that is commensurate to the difficulty that you're standing in front, but you need to cut down the tree. So what's the first thing we pray? We pray that God would allow for us to continue to see the tree as the raw material for the house so that you do not complain. Let me tell you something. If you can understand the principle of praise over whining, anything that God has promised to you will happen quicker than it ordinarily would. You see, because complaining delays the process. The children of Israel, it took them 40 years to complete a journey that should have taken about 11 months. Why? Because people kept complaining. So every time they complain, God is like, okay, we're going to have to do this again. We're gonna have, we have to do it again. Until we do it right, we're not going forward. Because I don't want to teach you corruption. We have to do it right. Because if God lets you get away with doing it wrong, then you begin to think that wrong is right. And that is the reason why he allows you to keep having the same experience again. Many of us keep repeating the same class in God simply because God does not want you to think that your wrong answers are right. So when you stop complaining, guess what? Everything takes off. It's very easy. It's very simple geometry. When you complain, it brings you down. I mean, I can't imagine. Have you ever been in a mood for complaining and you feel very glad in your spirit? No, when you complain, it brings you down. It cuts you down. But when you praise, it cuts the tree down. Because praise lifts you up. Praise the Lord. I'm resisting the, the urge to open this again because of time. But the second prayer point, like I told you, the prayer point is twofold. The Bible says the man of God went with them and when they got to the Jordan, they cut down the trees. But they got to the Jordan before they cut down the trees. So we're going to get up now and we're going to pray for patience and divine understanding to know the time that we're in. Many of us have yet to get to the Jordan, but we're already swinging the axe. And by the time you get to the Jordan, you're too tired. 
Many of us, we see this on the daily basis. People that we know, Kaneda, that had the that have the call of God upon their lives. But they haven't got to the Jordan and they want to preach. They haven't gotten to the Jordan and they want to organize conferences. And there is no power. And Satan would allow people to come to your conference so that they can put demons on you that you cannot cast off. And then you burn out even before you have started out. Because they haven't gotten to the Jordan and, and they've already started cutting down trees. And so we need two things. Eyes to see, even when it doesn't look like it. And the patience to wait until we get to where God wants us to cut down the trees. Many of us, the reason why we are where, we, where we're at is because of the fact that we mistook some little bush along the way for the thicket where we have enough to build with. And we stopped short before we got to where God said to go. So we're going to say those two prayers together and I want you to open your heart as you say those prayers because it's a time for you to pull down strongholds. To cast down the strongholds and the high places that you have erected by complaining. I may have to explain that so that you can be effective in your prayer. You know, back in the days, people would raise up altars to make sacrifices to God, right? When you make altars to make sacrifices to God, it's like praising God for the things that he has done and praising him by faith for the things that you have yet to receive. When you complain, however, it is also like raising a high place offering profane incense to God. Remember that I told you on Saturday that everything that we do has an aroma. And so when you offer profane incense, guess what happens? You look through the Old Testament. When people erect a high place that is offering profane incense to the Lord, what happens? They empower the, the gods or the idols. Every false altar becomes a stronghold that is championed by a demonic or satanic force. So some of the opposition that we are fighting were oppositions that we constituted ourselves. So we're going to pray with that in mind because it becomes a threefold prayer. One of it is a repentance prayer. Repenting for every one of those times that you have complained against the trees because you didn't see the house. And by so doing, erecting altars of profane sacrifice that have created strongholds in your own life. Pull down those strongholds that you built. I think that should be easy. Because if you built it, that means you can take it down. <laughs> Let me tell you something. This thing is very simple. When you look at Old Testament, the same high places that were built by men were taken down by men. The reason why Hezekiah got a commendation was because he took down high places that were built by his ancestors. So you can pull down altars that have been raised by the ones before you. Because by the time you do all of these things and you know that God is going with you, guess what? You will build and there will be, there will be room, not just for you, for all of you. These people said we're not just building for us but they're building for all the men in their company. God wants to bless you enough for you to be able to accommodate friends and family. For you to be able to accommodate the stranger that is going along the way. This blessing is for all and sundry but you need to be able to build a house for it. Let me do you a favor folks. I'm going to open this Bible one more time and read something to you from the book of Jeremiah chapter 7. And we're going to slot that into that prayer and there will be deliverance. I say to you today, there will be deliverance. Praise the Lord. We're gonna read Jeremiah chapter 19, I mean chapter seven. We're going to read from verse 19, verse 12, and verse 21. And we're gonna combine all those three things into one quick prayer. So what does verse 19 say? It says, do they provoke me to anger? Says the Lord. Do not provoke, do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? How did people provoke God, to, uh, provoke God to anger in the Old Testament? By complaining. Every time they complained, they provoked God to anger. So we're going to repent for every time that we have complained about the trees because we didn't see the house. Because the reason why we have not seen his glory is because 
look at what the Lord says. He says, you're provoking me, you think. But in reality, you're provoking yourself to shame. You are the one that is being kept away from the glory of the fulfillment of promise. So quit holding yourself back. Give praise rather than give complaints. Now let's go to the verse 12. Verse 12 says, but go now to my place which is in Shiloh where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. What was their wickedness? Complaining. And what did God do to them? He cut them down. He says, I will cut you down for a season. And so we have been cut down simply because we did not know what God was doing with us. Trust has been an issue between us and God. If we trust that this same God who said, let's go to the other side, even when the storms blow, he still cares about us. Look at the disciples. Their problem was not the storm. Their problem was the lack of trust. They looked at Jesus and they did not say to Jesus, wow, Jesus, this wind is really boisterous. No, they said, do you not care that we perish? Many of us live our lives as though we care about us more than God cares about us. Can we repent tonight? from that wickedness and know that he cares for you more than you can ever care for yourself. Now, so that is 19, 12. Now look at 21. 21 says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. Add your what? Your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and what? And eat meat. Now let me explain this. This takes a little bit of explanation because it's, it's a combination of several things, but God was talking to a man who knew the ways of God. So when he says, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices, what are burnt offerings? When we come before the Lord and we recognize things that represent shortcomings in our lives and we're ready to let them go, they constitute our burnt offerings. Now, add to your burnt offerings what? Sacrifices. Many of us do not realize that the most, the highest dimension of the demonstration of love is not commitment. It is what? Sacrifice. God made a commitment to us from time immemorial, we knew that. But what was the culmination of the love of God was John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God says, I want you to walk with me. I want to come with you. Then what binds us, you and I, in this ride that we're in is love. Show me that you love me. I have already shown you that I love you. Peter says, we love him for he first loved us. He's demonstrated his love. The Bible says how it, how it is or how is it that God demonstrated his love toward us by not withholding his only begotten son. He gave him to us freely that we may know that he is for us. And so if he's for you, you are supposed to be for him. Where are your sacrifices? God is asking you to let go of certain things. Not because he's broke and needs what you can give, but because he wants to lighten your own load. So we need to identify what needs to go. This is a continuation of what the Lord inspired on Saturday. Remember on Saturday, the Lord says you need to identify what needs to go. So we're going to add to our burnt offering, which is our repentance. We're going to add to our repentance, sacrifice. So we're repenting before the Lord of all the wickedness of complaining, all the wickedness of doubting God, and all the wickedness of not recognizing that everything works together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You repent of that and then make a sacrifice to make yourself lean before the Lord. And the Bible says you will eat meat. What is meat? Jesus says, my meat is to do your will. When you do those things, you will start to do the will of your father. You will cut down the trees and build and the edifice will be as it is in the mind of God to the glory of his name. And you shall be filled. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Alan, let us break bread at this particular moment. And as we break bread, in fact, when I sought the Lord concerning this meeting, in fact, let me put it the way it really happened. I was busy thinking about this and that, and the Lord said to me, he says, I'm pulling my people closer tonight. Yeah. Oh, when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's good. He is drawing us closer to himself. So now let me just give a quick summary as we're getting ready to break bread. The word of the Lord is that the Lord is on the move and is bringing you or he's inviting you to come alongside with him. 
The things that have been in the way in the past of you coming alongside with him have been the false sacrifices and offerings that you've been offering. Complaining, doubting, not trusting enough. The Lord says, I want you to do away with every one of those things. And then add to the burnt offering a sacrifice. Identify what things you will give up to enjoy this season with me. God wants you to come alongside with him. But I tell you what, I started telling you about seven things. I, I stopped at two. But when you listen to it again, you will see that there is a couple more, even in the passages that we have read. Things like not walking by sight, but by walk, walking by faith. Things like taking more seriously your relationship with the Holy Spirit. If you get to a place and you don't understand what God is doing, before you complain, ask questions. God wants to answer your questions rather than be made subject to your assumptions. So don't just assume that the Lord is no longer for you. Don't just assume that you're under attack from the enemy. Ask God and say, God, what is this thing that I am looking at? Before you start shooting in all directions, ask God first so that you don't get ahead of him. Remember, even though he's asked you to go, he is coming along with you, but he appears like you are going along with him simply because he has already accomplished what he's telling you to do. So trust him that the one who is asking you is faithful. I shared a verse of scripture with Michelle yesterday. And I believe it's going to benefit every one of us too. Psalm 52. The Bible says in Psalm 52, I believe verse 7. The Lord says that I will perform that which I have commanded. That which I have promised. I am the one that will perform it. And so if God is going to perform it and he's asking you to come alongside, you should be in full confidence. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. I know you got quiet here because it's quite a rebuke, this message. But I'm telling you, if you would take these things to heart and begin to operate by them, you will be above and not beneath. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now, we're still in the seasons of four. So let me tell you four things very quickly that is going on in the world. There is confusion that has been released into the world by God. And you need to have your heart safeguarded from confusion. Why? Am I telling you these things? This is kind of like a heavenly news update. There are miscreants in this world who are trying to take what God wants to give to you and I. Remember that in September, on the 3rd of September, I told you the angel of the Lord came here and he said there was a change of God. The ones who have been oppressing, the Lord is removing them, but the miscreants around them were trying to take over. And they're already devising ways to take over the world, politically, religiously, and economically. And the Lord is saying, I will confuse the devices of the crafty. So if you are not under the covering of God, this season that we're going to there will be a lot of confusion so if you're not under the wings of the almighty you might just find yourself getting confused for no reason it is not the devil it is heaven that is at work but you need to hold fast the profession of your faith so that you are not confused right one more thing that is happening in the world God is testing to see the ones who will trust him and how does God test for the ones who will trust him, he shakes the world. When everything shakes, God wants to see what you're going to hold on to. Whether you're going to hold on to your pocket, whether you're going to hold on to your friend, or whether you're going to hold on to him. So there's a mighty shaking coming upon the earth. And the people who are sitting at the foot of the Lord Jesus will not be moved because they're already there holding to the hem of his garment. And they will not be shaken. Now let me say this. I said this a couple of months ago that Satan is coming after children. Right? So don't be surprised if you hear in the news that there is a kind of disease or kind of illness that is affecting mostly children. It's already started. Okay. In Canada, so a lot of children are getting sick. Alrighty, I didn't even know that. But this is something that was revealed to me. So what the devil is doing is the devil is coming after children. Right? He's coming after children because if he hits the children, he hits everybody. And so you need to stand in the gap for your children. Lay hands on your children often and pray for them. It's something that I started to do by the Holy Spirit a couple of weeks ago. I would grab my children and just lay my hands on their head. I've been inviting them to come and pray with me. Come and pray with me. Just 10 minutes. Come, come and pray. Simply because if we do not pray for them and teach them how to pray, we are exposing them. And no child of yours is too young to learn how to pray. William prays with me. 
because I know stuff that he likes to do. So I set it up around me in the basement. So he's doing his own little stuff, but I am there praying. The other day, after like 20 minutes, you know what he started to do? He started going to the same corner of the room that I was going to and turning around like I would turn around because I was pacing back and forth in the room and he started doing that. He did that a couple of times. And I'm like, yeah, train up a child in the way that he should go. That is thing number three. Thing number four is this. I see a film. How many people remember back in the day in elementary school, we used to have these rulers that have pictures on them. And if you turn it a certain way, the image changes. Did you guys have rulers like that? Some of it are on toys. When you, it depends on the angle from which you look at it, it's a different image. Because there is a kind of polarizer that comes to be placed on an image that gives it different views from different perspectives. There is a film like that that is coming upon the earth that will skew what is before you. The Lord is reminding us once again that in this season of force, we need to operate by what we hear as opposed to what we see. Don't let the devil tempt you to speak based on what you see. Speak based on what you hear. Stay close to the Lord. Let him speak to you. So those four things are news update and they're almost kind of like, by the way, but they're very important for us to know so that we have our coordinates right. Okay, because what's the most important thing about the season of four? It's not the four horsemen. The most important thing when we come to the season of four is that God is giving us directions on how to operate because the number four is the number of direction. I know that it's also the number of the good news, but it's the way by which God gives us direction on how to operate. Don't worry, by the time these things begin to settle into your spirit, you will do things that even you will be amazed by. And say, is this really me? It is you, because you are allowing the word of God to dwell in you richly. The last thing we're going to do before we break bread is this, if we can all stand up at this particular point in time. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But if you don't resist him, He's going nowhere. Jesus had to say to Satan, get thee behind me. Because he has no, he has no alternative. It's either he gets you or he gets nothing. So you have to resist the devil. Let me tell you one of the ways by which you resist the devil. The most effective way of resisting the devil is inviting God to do it. Can I say that again? Because God may come down to do it or send the right angel to do it. You don't have to worry about the technicalities or try to memorize the names of angels. Just ask the Heavenly Father and then he will send the right person. Remember Daniel's prayer that was held by the Prince of Persia and the angel that was carrying the blessing could not overpower the Prince of Persia because he has not been given the authority to even say anything to the Prince of Persia. He had to phone home and God sent the right angel for the job. When the body of Moses was being disputed by Satan, the archangel of the Lord Michael came to grab the body of Moses from the Mount of Nebo where God had hid the body of Moses. And I've, taught, I've told you before, the reason why God did that, one of the reasons was because the body of Moses had technically become an immortal body because he had seen God, he had died, and he was living transfigured. And God knew that people would worship that body if they can lay their hands on it, so God hid it. And when it was time for him to be reactivated in heaven, to be brought out of sleep, he needed his body. And so God sent Michael to go and get it. Very critical mission. And, the, and Satan was like, I'm not sure you, need to, you can take this out of here. And the Bible says that even the archangel of the Lord did not revile Satan because he was considered a heavenly dignitary. Because he's still running around and God is aware of it. And so what did he do? He called on God. If Michael, who drove Satan out of heaven at the beginning, is calling on God, is you now know exactly how to do it. Many of us have been trying to resist Satan by our own willpower. And you cannot resist Satan by your own willpower because even Satan knows that it is not by, it is not by willing or by racing. The Bible says it is not of him that wills, it is not of him that runs, but it is of God who shows mercy. So Satan knows that God does not expect you to do it by your willpower. So what do you do? Call on God and say, God, I am inviting you into this situation. And the moment God shows up, whether in person or through the ministry of one of his archangels, guess what? The devil knows exactly what, what, he knows what to do. That is how to resist the devil. And so this season, you will resist the devil and he will flee from you. You will resist the devil and he will flee 
from you. You have work to do. You have work to do and you have to walk with the Lord. The last thing you need is the devil dancing around you. So resist him by the presence of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. So let us break bread together. Let us take the body of the Lord Jesus and drink of his blood. And this is the moment wherein we say the prayer of 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 4. I described the prayer request but we haven't prayed it so we're going to pray it this moment. And I'm not just praying over you. I want you to also open your mouth and pray. And remember what we're praying about is that we will recognize we will see what God sees and that we're going to be patient. Rather than complaining, we will be patient and give God praise. And so, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because on the way to Emmaus, those disciples who did not recognize you, the situation changed the moment you broke bread and gave to them. Their eyes were open. As we, their eyes were opened. As we eat of your body today, as we receive the broken bread, bread of your flesh. Let our eyes be open to see the mansions and not just the trees. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you because as we drink of the blood of Jesus today, we will receive the mind of Christ afresh. And the, this mind of Christ is one that is able to endure the cross and despise the shame. So we will not get ahead of you, but we will be patient until we have seen the fulfillment of promise in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm going to give you a moment right here to settle certain things with the Lord. And just open your mouth and pray. This is the moment wherein some of you have to repent and say, Lord, I give up complaining. I give up distrust. I give up getting ahead of you. I give up leaning on my own understanding. I put them upon the altar and I set them on fire. They are my burnt offerings before you, O oh God. I'm not going to continue to get ahead of myself and get ahead of you. I would wait until my change comes. Just like Job said, all the days of my vain life, I will wait until my change comes. Stop getting ahead of yourself. Stop trying to help yourself. Stop trying to take the place of God. God is your help. You cannot help yourself. The arm of flesh shall fail. Begin to instruct your subconscious mind to stop having intentions that are unwholesome, to stop having intentions of getting ahead of God, to be patient and to wait upon the Lord, your King's man redeemer, who will never fail you. Deliver yourself of hastiness. Deliver yourself of wickedness. Deliver yourself of the strongholds of the false altars that you have built. Repent before the Lord and make your burnt offerings right this very moment. And say, Lord, I am not going back where I have come from, but now I am moving forward toward destiny in your company. Lord, I am moving forward by the leading of your Holy Spirit. Even the strongholds that have been built by my ancestors, by my by the generations before me. I pull them down today in obedience to the cross. I resist the devil by, by invoking your presence. Lord, you are with me and you are for me, not against me. And if you are with me, no one can be against me. I stand confident in your favor. I stand confident in your grace. I stand confident in your love. My heart will not move unless it is at the sound of your name. My heart will not move unless to the beat of your love. In the mighty name of Jesus, I will remain steadfast, immovable, unshakable, and the good soil of obedience will yield for me the fruits of righteousness. In the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, I will wait on you. I will wait on you, almighty God. In the beauty of your holiness, I will wait on you, almighty God. In the beauty of your holiness. I want you to make that commitment to the Lord today to say that you will wait on him. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, let's be seated and we're going to wrap this thing up in just a moment. Alan is going to come here in a moment to receive the offering. But before then, there is one more thing that I want to say to us very quickly. There is a lot of instruction that is coming out of heaven. A lot of instructions 
come into the body of Christ. And I know many of you have a longing and a yearning for a personal word. Because you know that God has gifted to us in this house such an experience in the gift of the prophetic. I can feel it. I feel the pull for the word, wanting to know what to do. Many of us want to receive a word from God. Wow, what do I do in this situation? What do I do in that situation? But I want to just remind you that we have come to the season of the equipping of the body and there is just not enough time to give out instructions that are the collective instruction and still be given individual orders. So this is how you resolve what seems like a deficit. The way to resolve it is this. In the midst of what the Lord is issuing out as a command for the church and the posture that we need to take is the instruction for you as an individual. And you can extract it once you begin to focus on what God is saying to the church. So don't think that God has abandoned you. Don't think that it's no longer important to God the decisions that you need to make, whether to move or not to move, whether to buy or to sell whether to speak or to hold your peace. No, every one of those things is intertwined. It, it is written there. So let me give you another interpretation of the word that came forth that within our worship is the prophetic. When you obey what God is saying to the church, it is a sign of your worship. And in that obedience and that heart of worship is the instruction for the decisions you need to make. Having said that, I want to hand something to you that the Lord gave to me. A couple of months ago, I stood here and I told you about the Yorim and the Thummim. How many people remember the Yorim and the Thummim? Which is the way the high priest will prophesy back in the days. Whenever there's a decision to be made, do we go to war or not? He will put his hand in the pouch that is behind this ephod. And if he pulls out the Yorim, then they know that they have to go. If he pulls out the Thummim, then they know that they have to stay, depending on how they present their algorithms before the Lord. So I know that many of us are eager to make certain decisions. So I offer to you today the Yorim and the Thummim. When you pray, set two odds before the Lord and it will help you choose so that those things that are keeping you from truly functioning, God wants to tell you things that are strategic to the warfare of the body of Christ, but you're busy waiting for him to tell you things that are particular to your own personal situation and it's become a noise in your airwaves. And God wants to help you take care of it. So the Yorim and the Thummim is yours. Set the ought before the Lord. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33, I believe it says, though the lot is cast into the laps, it's very decision. Every decision is of the Lord. You will not gamble. You will hear a voice telling you, this is the way. So that is a gift to you, a bonus. Because I, as I was standing here, I kept feeling the pool. People were fishing for a word. And that's because you need one. And the Lord is saying, this is how you will navigate. It's a different season, and you need to be light on your feet. Before Alan comes to bless the offering, I want to say this very quickly as the band is playing soft music in the background. I want to say this very quickly. I'm excited about this season because I know that we are coming to a new season of new things. Let me explain what I mean. A new season of new things is a season so the season before the new season of new things is a season that leaves you completely emptied out. You're going to be completely spent because God does not want any one of those old things to remain as you're going into the new season. So if you feel that there is a pull on you to do this, to do that, yes, that is God helping you to pour out the old so that you can make room for the new. The way it's going to happen to many of us is that we're going to be praying more. You know what happens in the place of prayer? You're pouring out because prayer is a sacrifice. You're pouring out, you're pouring out. And as you pour out, you make room for the new. It's 921, let's just stop it right there in righteousness. But very quickly, Alan, get ready to, take, to come and bless the offering. Very quickly, if you want to prepare the offering and the tithes, you can go ahead and do that. But I don't think I want to go down before I have told you this. You see in the book of Mark chapter three, verse four, and I want you to memorize this thing if you can, but whatever you do, meditate upon it very greatly. In the book of Mark, chapter four, verse three, what does it say? It says, behold, a sower went to sow. 
when the Lord says to you that I am on the move, he is also sowing. Pay attention. God is sowing in this season. Michelle, God is speaking to each and every one of our hearts and is spreading the power of what things he wants to do through the church. It is now up to you to receive it and to believe it. What will determine the harvest that you have? Shayla, you know the Bible says that the ground by itself brought forth a harvest. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. So I am encouraging you in this season. Pay attention. The Lord has something to say. Will you grab it? Will you believe it? And will you bear the fruits? It's up to you. God bless you. Hallelujah. What a word, what a word. I ain't going to hold this. You see the tithe and offerings on the screen there. As we prepare our offering, let's just give thanks to God for what he's done this evening. So much revelation here, so much insight. The book of Psalm chapter 50, verse 14, it reads, Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. So as we prepare our offerings, let's give thanks. Let's give with a heart of worship, with a heart of thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. We thank you so much for this time, oh God. We thank you that you take us by the hand, oh Lord, and you guide us. Father, we thank you for speaking to us so plainly tonight. Lord, we ask of thee, knowing that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, O oh God, that all silver is yours, that all gold is yours. We ask of thee, O oh God, that this offer be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, may it rouse heaven. Father, we give you praise and we give even, O oh God, in worship as a sign of your move. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this season we walk hand in hand, step in step, oh God. All glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. Communion House, what a night. Don't forget, this Saturday we'll be back at it. The fire continues. And if you have not seen yet, we have more um, business cards with our QR code in uh, the foyer there, right before you get into the kitchen, please take some. We're gonna be on a big campaign, giving out more cards uh, to invite people. Uh, nearing the end of the year, it's already come upon us. Uh, we really wanna have a large turnout. We wanna bless folks, and we really want others that we know have been assigned here to know that this is the house for them, okay? So we wanna be encouraged in that. Let's, let's charge ourselves back up in inviting folk, and so uh, we look forward to that, all right? Amen. Everyone have a blessed night.